We're going to get started in our time in the Word today. Uh, and I want to start today, as I often do, with two, uh, two stories. So, two stories, two different places in the world, two different times in the world, two different accusations that are taking place in these stories, right? On the one hand, there's a young orphan girl in Nova Scotia, Canada. All of our Canadians are not here today, but shout out to them. All right, in the late 1800s, she's longing for family and for a home, and she's actually on a test period, meaning that if she does well in the home she's staying in, then she is actually going to become a part of that family, making the Cuthbert name and the beautiful countryside estate of Green Gables her home. However, after playing with the family heirloom, uh, and, and not even misplacing it, but just putting it down in the wrong place, she is falsely accused of stealing the heirloom. Only for the heirloom to be found at a later point, mistakenly misplaced, not by the young girl, but rather by the accused. The only thing is that after the accusation, the family had sent the young girl back to the orphanage. And so in, in sorrow and in remorse, they race off on, you know, this is the 1800s, so they're like on a horse. They're going and they want to go back to the orphanage to reclaim the girl and to say, hey, we are sorry. They ask for her forgiveness. She forgives them, and it starts a new chapter in the life of the girl and the family. Story one. Story two. A newly released prisoner in revolutionary France is alone on the streets. Marked by his past failures, he cannot find a job, nor can he find a place to actually call home. He's alone and on the streets. He's cold and he's hungry. He maybe even is on death's door until he's taken in by a local priest. And the priest gives him sanctuary that evening, makes up a, a bed nice and fresh for him, and lets him stay there. In the middle of the night, uh, the newly released prisoner awakes. And uh, he sneaks out of the bed, the bed freshly made for him, and he goes into the kitchen and he packs up every valuable that he can see silverware, serving platters, dishes, and he runs off into the middle of the night. Caught by local police that same night, he's brought back to the parish, wherein the priest looks at him, uh, and, and, and he looks back at the priest, and the police say, we found this man, the evidence of his thievery in the bag of stuff that they actually found on him. This man's clearly not a good criminal. Found on him, and they say, do you want to press charges? And the priest responds with deep compassion, no. Uh, you see, he did not steal those items. I gave him those items. And the police release him, and he has a new opportunity in life. Uh, which of these stories is more just? Which of them has the more of, of justice? What are these stories, the first one taken from the beloved children's book, Anne of Green Gables, if you didn't know, and the second, taken from the legendary book, playwright, movie, multiple times over on everything, uh, Les Mis. Um, what do they teach us, right, about justice? What do they teach us about judgment? What does a man being forgiven like this teach us about fairness and about mercy? What do they teach us about the anger of what it feels like to be falsely accused? And what do they teach us? about the shame of what it means when the accusation is not false, but rather when the accusation is true? What do they teach us about that overwhelming feeling when mercy arrives? What do they say about the incredible place that kindness and compassion and mercy have in uh, justice? You're gonna have to hold those answers and if you don't have any answers, you're going to hold, have to hold off for the answer to those questions a little bit later. Because today, uh, I wanted to, to ask you that rather so that you can get in the frame of mind to start thinking about that. The idea of justice and mercy and fairness. Because today we're starting a new sermon series in the book of Isaiah. And it's a book almost entirely focused on God's righteousness, judgment, and justice. It's almost entirely focused on that. And here's the thing, we're not going to be zooming through the book of Isaiah. In fact, we're going to be taking our time. The thing is, we're also not going to spend several weeks on Isaiah. Uh, you might be thinking, how is that going to be accomplished? This has a, a number of books, a number of chapters in this book. Uh, 
here's the thing. We're going to go by what we're calling just a season-based approach to Isaiah. Uh, what I mean by that is today we're starting what we can only call season one of Isaiah. Uh, and this is we're going to go through the first six chapters over the course of the next six weeks. Uh, from there, uh, later in the fall of, or the spring of next year, we'll tackle season two. We'll have another six-chapter block. And then in the spring, we'll, chapter, we'll cover another bigger chunk of chapters in what we'll call season three. And we'll keep doing that until we get through the course of the book. And so if you're here in three years, or in two years, man, you're going to get to the end of this, and you're going to be like, wow, that was fun. You'll be able to go back and look at all the sermons on a playlist all at one time. Here's the thing. If you're not here in a couple of years because you moved, uh, whatever the case is, life is taking you to Nova Scotia, Canada, to have a throwback to the story we just said. Um, if that's the case, that's okay. You also can still check back in. Uh, I have a, a buddy of mine who I don't go to his church. I've never gone to his church, but, but they started this season-based approach in the book of Romans. And it's been super fun to actually just track back and to look at everything that's being said about Romans without having to go through these like really summarized uh, like, like five sermons in the book of Romans is all you're going to cover everything, and you're not. And so we want to try to do the book of Isaiah justice here. And so we're going to try to approach it in this way. With that being said, today uh, we're actually starting just with the, the beginning of Isaiah, and it, just an introduction, uh, and, and a bit of chapter one. Uh, and, and this is my hope, that through seeing God's heart for justice, righteous judgment, and mercy, one, that we will be transformed into people that pursue both righteousness and mercy, that you will pursue holiness and compassion in your life all at the same time, but that likewise, that will happen through you taking on a new understanding and a new experience with God's holiness. That through understanding what God's holiness actually means, it would, pers- it, would, it would motivate you to both pursue holiness and to rest in his holiness all at the same time. And if that's where we actually find ourselves, then I promise you the life that you're going to be living is one that's going to produce beauty both outside of you and that's going to produce peace and joy inside of you. With that, let, let's get into why that might be, though. With that in mind, let's go ahead and start with chapter 1. We're actually going to read uh, Isaiah 1, 1, and then we're going to read 21 through 26. It's kind of like a summary of the first chapter. And so if you would stand with me out of respect for God's word, we're going to actually uh, read it together, if you would like, with me. From there, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, inviting you to respond with thanks be to God. So I'm going to go and get started. Isaiah 1, 1 says, The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of kings Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah. Going down to verse 21. The faithful town, what an adulteress she has become. She was once full of justice, righteousness once dwelt in her, but now murders. Your silver has become dross to be discarded. Your beer is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, friends of thieves. They all love graft and chase after bribes. They do not defend the rights of the fatherless, and the widow's case never comes before them. Therefore, the Lord God of armies, the mighty one of Israel, declares, Ah, I will get even with my foes. I will take revenge against my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and will burn away your dross completely. I will remove all your impurities. I will restore your judges to what they were at first and your advisors to what they were at the start. Afterward, you will be called the righteous city, a faithful town. This is the word of the Lord. All right, have a seat. These are, uh, these are heavy words, uh, real heavy words. Many pastors, I got to level with you, see Isaiah and a lot of the prophets as a, a book, and books, I should say, in general, to kind of be avoided on a Sunday morning. Uh, these words, what, what, where do they fit in this service where we're talking about Jesus and faith and hope and love? And Isaiah's out here like, yeah, God looks at you and he's like, adulterous. And it's like, oh, 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 calm down. You, I mean, there's a practical reason why people feel that way, right? Why pastors can feel that way. This first chapter of Isaiah is nothing less than searing. It's an incredible indictment on the people of Israel, a people that God had cared for, loved, redeemed, and rescued, and yet at the very same time, also a people that had regularly turned their back on God, deserted him, and chosen the gods and ways of the people around them over him over and over again. 
And Isaiah enters the chat in this whole scenario, in this whole landscape, not with passive aggressive comments about how he'd appreciate it if they had remembered all that he's done. Like a mother who at Thanksgiving is like, can you set the table? I did spend 20 something hours in labor with you, right? Like that type of passive aggressive comment. She's laughing because that's, that's her. That's who I'm referencing right there. That's my mom. So. <laughs> no, he doesn't come through like that. He comes through with hot fire. In fact, verse 2 is, I've raised children and they have rebelled against me. The whole rest of chapter 1 continues in the same fashion. You are a sinful nation. Your land is desolate. Turn away from evil things. Come to me. Let's work this out together. And all of chapter 1 crescendos into verse 21 the verse that we, we're mainly focusing on today. It all builds into this poem. It's a poem that starts with a faithful city and ends with a faithful city, but everything in between is anything but. The idea, and then idea by idea, level by level, God makes his thoughts clear about his position toward Israel. You used to be filled with justice and righteousness. Now you've become a danger to others and a place filled with injustice. You dilute everything from your beer to anything else, but you don't dilute it for no reason. You dilute it because you yourselves are diluted. Your rulers don't consider the least of these. The, the, the widow and the orphan, their cases are never brought to them. Your rulers are corrupt, but not just because, because they, they're corrupt by chance. They're corrupt because you're corrupt. There, there's an inherent idea of, of a direct correlation between the condition of the people and the condition of the country. The poem indicts. This poem accuses. And here's the thing, this poem judges. It judges. God judges. How do you feel about that word? Judge. God is, he's judging. He's looked at people and he is, he's judged them. Does it make you feel like God is judgmental? Here's the thing. Judgment in our modern culture is like a curse word. It's an idea that often feels very far and very foreign in a culture that's so individualistic. In other words, our Western culture believes and, and values individuality deeply. We hang our hat on individuality. We believe being an individual, expressing yourself uniquely and being uniquely you, is the most important thing that you could possibly do. And hear me, I don't want to actually just dog that. That philosophy has highlighted certain truths about God's creation more than any other philosophy in the history of the world. When Scripture and the Spirit of God has breathed life into that individualistic disposition, it has produced abolitionists fighting for the freedom of other people. It's created men and women walking alongside uh, of one another, advocating for women's suffrages and women's rights to vote. It's produced blacks and whites marching alongside of each other for the sake of civil rights in the 1960s. It's brought about a value in how God made you individually, how he sees you and how he's crafted you and how you're uniquely you and how every person under the sun has been given value and dignity as a result of being made in God's image. Every individual individual, when this has been breathed into with life and by the Spirit, it's produced amazing and incredible things and provided testimony of how deeply God loves you, knows you, and sees you. Praise God and amen to all that that actual culture has done for the sake of humanity by highlighting those truths. Praise God. But hear me, when that philosophy has been empty, when that individualism is empty of God's Spirit, empty of God's truths, empty of God's scriptural truth, it creates elderly communities that are oftentimes forgotten about. It creates high rates of divorce and people so individualistically focused on themselves that they can't come together to try and work on a marriage to make it work and it takes steps forward. It creates marginalized communities that are forgotten by people that have insulated themselves from the rest of the world with the lives that they've made and the material items that they have that all they gotta worry about is them, themselves, and no one and nothing else. That's what we live in. It's done a lot of good. That sense of individualism apart from God's spirit, though, has actually done a lot of bad, too. 
And that's not the only thing that it's insulated itself from. In this culture, we also insulate ourselves from judgment. Because when this approach lacks spiritual truth, right, then, then often the result is people who believe their only judge is their own thoughts and beliefs. That's it. When the ultimate authority we have is ourselves, we can't be judged by anyone else. It's impossible. Their judgment is only an opinion because the ultimate authority in my life is not them, God, or anything else, but it's me. And the moment that takes place, the moment that's rooted deeply in our heart, if that's where we are, then every single judgment that comes against us is not healthy, it's oppressive. Why? Because it's seeking to infringe upon our rights as an autonomous ruler of ourselves. Every judgment is oppressive. Every correction is evil. Why? Because we don't submit to that. We submit to us. And no one else can tell us the right way to live, think, act, feel, or anything else except us. That's unhealthy. Friend, if that's you, I want to lovingly warn you as a, as a friend, as a as a pastor, as a brother, check yourself. As they say, I'm not going to do it. Y'all thought I was going to do it. I ain't going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, y'all finished it. Y'all know. Check yourself, though. Because, friend, I, I want to lovingly tell you this. You're on a path to destruction. If no one else will tell you, I'll tell you. You're on a path to destruction. The scriptures say that, that the man who follows his own mind, right, his own heart, it leads him to destruction. You are on a path to destruction when every judgment is oppression, every correction is evil. You have set yourself up and teed yourself up for failure because you alone are not enough to guide your life. If you think you are the captain of your ship and the captain of your soul, and you are, through your own simple intelligence and wisdom and cunning, are going to lead you into life, into waters of life, friend, I want to tell you lovingly, that's not going to happen. Because you are going to encounter some rough days, and if the only thing you have to depend on is you, the only wisdom you have to depend on is you, then friend, you're going to head into the heart of destruction. I lovingly want to make that clear. But here's the thing. I want to be careful on how we judge each other if we struggle with correction, though. Because for some, this rejection of correction, this rejection of judgment is absolutely an act of pride and corruption. It's an excuse to abuse power and to oppress others and to live selfishly. But for some, this is not a, 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 an alignment with corruption, but a response to corruption. Because like that young orphan girl we talked about in the beginning of this sermon, right? Maybe we've been falsely accused. Maybe we've been hurt. Maybe we've been cornered. Maybe we felt the weight of judgment in an ugly and a hurtful, in an angry, in an evil, in a corruptive, in an oppressive way that ends up making us respond by going, I'll never subject myself to that again. And so maybe it's not just the proud. Maybe it's the scared. Others still are wrestling with weight of things like insecurity. In a culture where we do value, we, we have what we like to call the meritocracy. That's what we like to call the American experiment. And I got my problems with America, but a lot of y'all know I'm low-key. Like, I love America, too. Like, I'm, okay, I could, I could, I'm more amens in the back from that than anything else. All right. <laughs> Apparently, y'all of America, too. All right. <laughs> but in that meritocracy, there can oftentimes be this observation that the best is the best, the first is the first, the greatest is the greatest. And when that's what you grew up in, when the middle and upper class environment that looks around you and has such high expectations of you that the moment you fail them, you become a second class citizen within that community, then indictment and judgment doesn't just feel uh, unsafe. It feels like you're fighting for your life. It feels like you're fighting for your very dignity. It feels like you're fighting for your very value. And so I don't want us to be too quick to judge each other, but, but that doesn't excuse the fact that no matter from what point we're coming from, no matter from what experience with judgment we have, when we approach these pages and we see such a seething indictment, a judgment from God, right? when we approach something like this, the idea that someone stands above us and can judge us, 
that their word about us is greater than our word about us. And their judgment of us is more accurate and more true than our judgment of ourselves. That leaves us with a gaping vulnerability that makes a lot of us uncomfortable. It makes a lot of us nervous. It makes us respond with questioning whether God is right or not or whether he's to be trusted or not. Why he would do that and why he would allow such things to happen. Why he would use such strong language. Why he would do this. Why he would do that. And oftentimes those excuses, oftentimes those responses are not just uh, actual indictments of God, but rather responses that come from the depths of our heart that reveal more about us than they do about him. What happens, though, uh, when judgment meets holiness? Because for Isaiah, that's precisely where his judgment comes from. It doesn't come from insecure feeling. It doesn't come from responses to oppression. It doesn't come from mistaken accusations. It comes from a holy God and from his holiness. From Isaiah, the person making the judgment on the Israelites is not an, it, a fallible human being who's vulnerable and who's... Per- ideas and and judgments can be easily persuaded, but rather from a holy God. What does that mean then, that a holy God, a holy God makes those types of judgments? Well, according to scholars, in Isaiah, holiness means three things. Holiness means three things in Isaiah. The first one is that it means that God is transcendent. He stands above us. He made us. It's his right to be able to judge us and to dictate what's right and what's wrong. This is not limited to how a child responds to a parent, but the transcendence of God positions God to us as though we are pot to a potter. We were created by him. Our purpose is designed by him. Our uses are, divine, are designed by him. The vision of our lives is his to give. And it's his to dictate. Like a fish doesn't find freedom on land, likewise, we don't find freedom outside of the creator's instruction and safety. He's the creator. He transcends. The second thing that holiness means in Isaiah, though, is that Isaiah is worthy, uh, as that God is worthy to judge. As a consequence of him being above us, transcending us, he's worthy to judge us. He has a right to. You're his. I'm his. This is all his. He stands above all of it. And as a result, he is the only one that is truly worthy to cast final judgment on any of it. And his judgment is right. His judgment is true. Because he transcends, because he stands above, is precisely why he is worthy to judge us. But the third thing that holiness means in Isaiah is this, that he forgives that he redeems, that within his right is likewise the right of life and the right of forgiveness and the right of redemption and the right of restoration. I want you to think back to the stories that we told at the beginning of this conversation. And I asked you, which one displays more justice? Which one displays more kindness? A false accuser or a victim who doesn't necessarily tell the truth, but does seek redemption and compassion uh, for the guilty. It's weird because in neither one of them, we necessarily see the right thing come out. In a perfect world, that little girl's not sent away. In a perfect world, uh, Jean Valjean, if you know what I'm saying, uh, he doesn't take the silver. He doesn't steal from the priest. But in a non-perfect world, a little girl is sent away and a man is brought back with a bag full of stolen goods. And in that imperfect world, the beauty of the justice is actually in the priest going, you are forgiven. Because only in his right, only in his power was there power to forgive. Here's the thing. Oppressors don't have the right to forgive. The guilty don't have the right to forgive. You would never think it just if Jean Valjean, the newly released prisoner, went back in there and was like, why y'all mad at me? I didn't do nothing to you. 
I didn't do nothing wrong. And then out of that type of compulsion, he looked at the priest and was like, you're going to give me that stuff. And the priest was like, no, you got it. It's yours. We'd be like, that's really unjust. Same outcome. Same exact outcome. The priest says the silver was his and the prisoner goes free. But in that scenario, it's unjust. Why? Because, because when the victim is the one that forgives, right, that's the place where compassion and justice come together. But, on, but here's the thing. Only the victim, only the person who's been sinned against has that right. No one else has that right. And because God is transcended, because he is worthy then to judge, is precisely why he is free to forgive. It's only in him having the right to judge us that he is free to forgive us. He's the right party. We cannot stand before God and go, I'm not guilty. Why? Because he's the one that was victimized. He's the one that was sinned against. Psalm 51, in, in one of the most grotesque, I mean, one of the most beautiful moments of repentance regarding one of the, grote one of the most grotesque actions in Scripture, David actually declares, it's against you and only you that I've sinned. Now, does that mean that he's not sinned against the real, very human people that he's hurt? Who are those people? Well, I mean, he took advantage of a woman and killed her husband. It's pretty aggressive. And yet in David's vision of the world, he recognizes, I've sinned against this God because that was his daughter and that was his son. It's, it's against God he sinned and it's against God we've sinned. And therefore, as a result, we do not have the right to stand and declare ourselves innocent. God has the right to judge. But it's in that right to judge that he has the freedom to forgive as well. It's precisely because he is holy, because he's worthy to judge that makes the words of forgiveness and love and care toward us so actual, actually powerful. It's all, about, uh, it's all about context, right? Again, what makes the priest powerful is that he had the power to forgive or not to forgive. And likewise, that's what makes the cross powerful, friend. Let me say it like this. If you have ever in your life looked at the cross of Jesus and removed the depths of God's anguish, vengeance, anger towards sin, and desire to judge justly, then you've robbed the cross of the majority of its beauty and its power. Why? Because it's at that cross where the, the incredible power of God's wrath towards sin, where his incredible desire to make right the world to judge justly, his right to judge, to cast judgment. It's at that very place that, it's at that very cross that that desire and intent collides with this mercy that we're talking about. And the result is a man bloodied in your place so that you could be made whole. The consequence is a man torn to shreds so that I could be forgiven and I could be made uh, one with God. All of that leads to that moment. All of it leads to Jesus' own desire to go to the cross for you, for me. The cross is surely an indictment, a judgment on our guilt. It tells us that we have violated a loving God. But the bleeding body of Jesus is a display of his immense mercy and his freedom to forgive. I want you to know that it's because he has the right to judge you, because he has the right to judge me, and because he has the freedom to forgive, that that's why he has the same freedom to look at you and say, I love you. That's why he has the same freedom to look at you and say, I forgive you. That's why he has the same freedom to look at you and say, I choose you. I redeem you. I call you. 
It's the same freedom that he has to say, you're mine. It's the same freedom he has to say, I'm yours. Without the holiness of God, in that moment, we don't know whether God's deepest desire is to truly love us or if he has to. But because he, he's holy, we know that he's chosen to. He's chosen you. And he'll choose you every day. Regardless of what you've done, he's chosen you and will choose you every day. Why? Because he's holy. Because he transcends. Because he has the right to forgive. And because out of that right comes the freedom to choose you. And he's chosen you every day. In, um, in Exodus 3, some of y'all have heard me talk about this a lot. Oh, I got to go. In Exodus 3, y'all have heard me talk about this a lot. Um, there's a story of how Moses is walking. And uh, it's a path that he's, he's walked a lot of times. But this particular day, he walks the path, and what does he see? Who knows? What? A burning bush, that's right. I thought someone said strangeness, and I was like, that's technically true. Because uh, if you were walking down the street and you saw a bush on fire, and yet it wasn't consumed, you'd be like, what's going on with that bush? And then if you got closer to it, and all of a sudden the voice of God came out of it, you'd be like, oh, there's something wrong with me today. My, I don't know if them vegetables have a little fungus on them. It's causing me to go on a little, a little trip here, but you'd be asking yourself what was going on. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to Moses. And out of this bush comes this big old voice that says, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him, let my people go so that they can come and worship me. And Moses gives a bunch of excuses, like, one, I stutter. And then God's like, don't worry about that. I'll let your brother talk for you. And then he's like, ah, they got a lot of gods. How can I actually show who you are? Do, is there a name that I can call you? If, if I go to them and I say, hey, the God of our forefathers has sent me to free us, who do I say even sent me? And there's this, this weird tradition laced in that. Because Moses had grown up in Egypt. And in Egypt, there was a spiritual practice in which once you invoke the name of a specific God, that God was indebted to you in some way to do what you asked them to do. So if I said, I call on Ra to do X, Y, and Z, there was a belief in Egypt that once I call on Ra, I have a bit of power over Ra. Ra is indebted to me in some way because I've called him by name. In a vast landscape where there was a lot of gods people believed in, this made complete sense, even if it doesn't make sense to you. And here was Moses looking and going, if I say, who sent me, can I use a name? Can I use a name to give them confidence that you're going to do what you said you're going to do? Because we're using your name in order to hold some form of power over you. And this is when this incredible response from God comes out. He says, my name is I am that I am. In other words, I'm going to be what I'm going to be. I am who I say I'm going to be. This response is a beautiful response because it looks at Moses and says, you have no power over me. You could call my name all day. If I don't choose to respond, I'll choose to respond. But my choice is never to not respond <laughs> because I have complete autonomy over me and my choice every time is going to be you. So he sends him back with the promise not that they have power over him, but that he has chosen them. And therefore, that's a power, a love, a care that they can count on. I'm going to end with this. This reminds me of a story about a king. Got a lot of stories going today. It's a king who had a wayward child, and that wayward child um, had good days and had bad days, but even the child's good days were pretty rough. Um, the child's good days were oftentimes marked by some form of rebellion, and the worst days were like these moments where they were like just falling over drunk in the middle of the streets and a laughing stock of, of the town. And this king had political opponents, right? King of political opponents. So the more those political opponents saw the conduct of that king's child, they started to see a bit of an end. That if perhaps they could use that child and present that child to the king, perhaps that king would either have to lose that child and be seen as unjust and uncaring, or perhaps 
he would have to step down from being king. And so one of his political opponents in particular says, I'll bring the charge. He's bold. And he goes and they arrest the child. And they bring him to, in front of the king and the king's judges. And he stands there. And on this particular day, it was a rough day. <laughs> the child didn't even look presentable. They were all rough. The evidence of their guilt was before them, if you know what I mean. And so the political opponent was filled with confidence, and he opened his mouth to begin a searing sting of accusations against the child. And before a single word got out of his mouth, the king simply replied, I rebuke you. I rebuke you, accuser, for this one, this one is mine. I've chosen to pull him. I've chosen to pull her out of the fire. She's a twig of my choosing. And in that moment, a bunch of the king's guards came and they swept that person away and they took back in the child. He was a young adult at this point and they started to clothe that child in righteousness, in like these beautiful garments that made it look like the dad. They even put a crown on the child's head, which I always like to think is pretty beautiful. So, who is this king? Did this story come from Green Gables or Les Mis? Is this about Anne Shirley Cuthbert or Jean Valjean? No, that story's about you. It comes from Zechariah chapter 3. You're the child, and God is the judge. And when you were filled with filthy rags and he desired to accuse you, that particular verse says it before the accuser could even open his mouth, the great mercy of the Lord shut him up. And that even when you have felt the shame that the accusations were not false but true, the king whose right it is to judge was free to forgive. And because he was free to forgive, what was uh, unrighteous and shameful on you has now been replaced with what is beautiful and what is good. And before the king, you have been declared innocent. In fact, you now wear a crown. Friend, we serve a holy God. Isaiah plans to write to us about a holy God, a God who transcends and a God who is above all. But through that very transcendence, he is worthy to judge, and it's out of that worthiness that brings, and he has the freedom to forgive, to redeem, and to restore. Your life is in entrusted hands, not because you have a nice king, not because you have a cool king, not because you have a, a, a chill king, a relaxed king, a king that doesn't take things seriously, but because you have a holy king. Precisely because you have a holy God, you can entrust yourself to him who judges justly and judges fairly, yet approaches every judgment with a desire and a distinct purpose to redeem and restore and renew and make new. That is your story, friend. Your story is not found in the dumps of someone else's accusations. It's not found in the shame of your own conscience. It's found in the voice of the king that transcends and is worthy and is free to forgive you and restore you and renew you. When you leave this place today, it is not so that you can hang your hat on what you've done and the fact that you're at church and you read your Bible today and you did X, Y, and Z, but you hang your hat on a holy God who has made you and knows you and sees you and is worthy worthy to judge you and sees the depths of your darkness and the heights of your good and declares and chooses day after day after day after day after day that he is yours and you are his. I, I lovingly want to tell you, I want you to clap a lot more and I love it when we get feedback, but I didn't even yell so that you could clap. I yelled so that you could know and feel and trust and go. Because I don't want you to clap here and forget tomorrow. That does no one here good. But if you walk out that door riddled with the depths of your shame, 
walking through life in a cycle of what feels like motivation to try and change, but guilt that always keeps you in the same place, you will never get to where God is taking you. But that's not his plan for you. His plan is not to rest on a cycle that's built off of what you've done right and what you've done wrong, wrong, but one that's built on his holiness, his transcendence, his worthiness to judge, and his freedom to forgive. You're meant to find yourself in awe of a place wherein his judgment meets his mercy on a man hanging on a cross so that you could be, ex so he could exchange with you your guilt for his victory. That's what you're meant to be out here to do. That's what Isaiah is going to point us toward regularly. As for context, am I just saying that? No. The New Testament writers actually quoted Isaiah more than they quoted any other prophet. They knew with a deep understanding that this man and the judgment and the righteousness and the justice, the holiness of the God that he's talking about is a holiness that we perfectly see in this Jesus and his mercy and his grace. And so let's prepare our hearts to see Jesus, to see him in his holiness and to see him in his mercy and righteousness. As we hold him, let's become like him. Let's let him work in us. Let's let him work through us for the sake of all around us, for the glory of his name and the good of you and me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for the gift of your holiness, the gift that you are transcendent. You stand above us. You are worthy of uh, judgment. You are right to judge. It is within your right, yet it's out of that right that gives you the freedom to choose us to choose our redemption, our restoration, to choose our freedom, to choose our life. And you've chosen it again and again, over and over. And you always will until your son returns to the exaltation of his name and the renewal of the heavens and the earth. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.